So this is actually not the first time I've given this talk, right? This is, uh, the, uh, I've given something like this uh, about w pretty much once every DEF CON, I think, uh, since uh, at least uh, DEF CON 1. And uh, the point of this talk has always been to just give a kind of big rapid fire introduction into some of the basics of how Ethereum works, some of the basics of uh, what Ethereum tries to accomplish, and uh, you know, just try to get it done within, um, I guess, uh, right now it's uh, 1.8 kiloseconds or uh, 150 slots. Um, so what is Ethereum, right? Ethereum is a uh, general purpose blockchain. So people have seen uh, general purpose uh, system platforms before, and people have seen blockchains before. And I think um, at this point, we can all kind of intuitively understand what the value of both of those uh, categories is, right? So blockchains can facilitate a large-scale consensus. They can protect against censorship. They can enable censorship-resistant applications. Blockchains are always available. If uh, you build on a blockchain, then the thing that you build on that blockchain is going to be available. It's not going to just get pulled under you because um, you know some particular company decides it would be 12% more profitable if they just change the API on you without notice. It is uh, you know, independent of any one particular nation state. It's not dependent on any particular um, you know, centralized corporation. Avoid dependence on uh, centralized parties. Um, it's uh, the uh, you know, one neutral ground at a time when almost every other grounds that we see is uh, you know, picking, uh, picking sides of uh, some kind or other. And uh, you know, often for very good reasons, but you know, blockchains are this uh, kind of base layer between uh, Parties that do not trust each other that you know, still allows them to have positive sum interactions. Uh, blockchains can allow applications that are open, that are transparent, where people who participate on them are, can be sure that the application is going to follow the rules that they signed up for. Right? So blockchains are great for you know, things that really need stability. Um, so there is a good reason why money is the first app. Um, but there's other apps as well, and uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of people behind those apps are going to be talking a lot about them at this conference. General purpose platforms are powerful too, right? General purpose platforms are interesting because they open the door to independent innovation. So if you have a general purpose platform, then it just makes it much easier to build something on top of it because if you want to build some specific thing, instead of having to like rebuild all the infrastructure yourself, you know, you just add a tiny little piece. Right? They can create powerful network effects between different types of applications. Uh, so, you know, you got your Uniswap, and then you got your like DAO that plugs into the Uniswap, and then that you and then that Uniswap itself gets used to trade between um, you know USDC tokens and Maker tokens, and you, know, you can create these kind of complicated chains of seven different applications that all talk to each other, and sometimes they talk to each other in insanely crazy ways within one single transaction that uh, you know really fun people from Paradigm go, uh, go and write amazing blog posts about. Um, but so. Uh, general purpose platforms lower the barriers to entry, they make it simpler to build, they uh, enable a lot of um, innovation, and uh, often general purpose platforms end up being far more useful than even the creators originally imagined. So Ethereum is a general purpose blockchain, right? And so Ethereum tries to uh, be both. So this is like one of the uh, sort of three minute pitches of uh, you know, what Ethereum could, be, uh, could allow you to do. So, what, what is Ethereum and how does this work? So th these three pictures are from a slide that I used to describe Ethereum uh, at, at some of the uh, previous uh, w Ethereum in 30-minute uh, sessions, right? So you know you have like single application blockchains, which are like pocket calculators. Then you have like multi-application blockchains that in explicitly support a small number of applications. I call them Swiss Army knife blockchains. And then you have you know the smartphone blockchain. Oh! It's, a, you know, it's general purpose, and if you want to do something, you just like download the app, right? So these days, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're in you know 2022, and uh, you know, talking about a general a blockchain being general purpose as though that's something cool is um, you know kind of like t uh, a uh, someone selling a house describing their house by saying you know we're we're really modern, we have a refrigerator. <laughs> Who here has a refrigerator? 
Well, lots of people have not raised their hands. I'm impressed. Um, I, I guess that uh, do people like order out? Do people eat raw food? Like, what's the idea here? I don't know. I mean, people have done refrigerator-free living successfully for like you know 1900 years in the AD era alone, but uh, that's uh, you know still impressive. Um, anyway, so like, what does the blockchain look like, right? So, one of the uh, I exciting things about doing this presentation this year is that like I actually had to change it a lot, right? Like between a lot of the yeah, previous uh, ones, it's like, okay, you know, it's Ethereum, here's how it works. Okay, it's Ethereum, it's how it works. Okay, it's Ethereum, it's how it works. But in between the last DEF CON and this one, the way that the Ethereum blockchain works just like changed very fundamentally, right? And the the rate of change and our ability to actually m execute on and implement changes to the Ethereum protocol, significant changes that we have wanted to do um, almost uh, since the yeah, protocol's uh, launch and, and that we've been talking about for almost a decade, but you know, finally managed to done, uh, has really been accelerating, right? So we had EIP-1559 in um, you know, 2020, and then the Beacon Chain launched, and now the Beacon Chain took over, and, you, and uh, you know, Ethereum is only a proof-of-stake system. So, you know, lots of very big changes, and uh, you know, lots of different things that we have to talk about, right? So, like, remember back in when, during the proof-of-work era, we had to talk about how, like, blocks include uh, uncle blocks, right? Do people remember this? So people remember how like, sometimes people would even you know try to be gender neutral, call them armor blocks instead of uncle blocks as well, and like you know I get this you know I get the sentiment very honorable sentiment, but like come on like armor just sounds like an insult for people who meditate, but okay, so these days you know we're proof of stake right and. Um, you know, the blockchain looks kind of different from what it did before right so what if, so, so let's like talk about what the blockchain looks like without reference to you know the dark old proof of work era that our grandchildren will eventually remember in the same light as how they uh, remember how house, houses used to not have refrigerators so you have blocks right and blocks contain transactions what is a transaction a transaction is an object sent by a user that contains information about something that they want to do, right? So if I want, if I have like some ETH, um, ETH, ETH is the yeah, cryptocurrency inside of Ethereum, and I want to send you one ETH, then that re request would be packaged up inside of a transaction. If, let's say, I have an NFT and I want to send you the NFT, that um, request is packaged up inside of a transaction. If I want to publish an entirely new application, then and create the smart contract for the application, and that's something I'll cover later, that is also packaged up inside of a transaction. So a transaction is like a, a package of data that contains information about stuff that somebody wants to do. These transactions get included in blocks. Every block is uh, created by, uh, by a yeah, validator, and a blo so blocks are just these packages of transactions, and one new block comes every slot. One slot is 12 seconds. Then we have attestations. Attestations confirm blocks, right? So attestations are like these messages signed by other validators that basically solidify the position of a block inside of the API blockchain, right? So when you have a block gets published, and then that block, within a few seconds, it almost immediately gets thousands of attestations supporting it, and that kind of solidifies that block's position in the chain, such that other blocks that compete with that block that like also try to claim that they're um, the you know, that are not kind of children of that block, but that are you know, siblings and then try to claim that they're the real history, those blocks are not, uh, not going to be able to get through, right? So in, as uh, Danny mentioned, you know, in the uh, entire almost month that post-merge uh, Ethereum has been running, we've only had like 26 reorgs and that's maybe an overcount. And even those cases are cases where a block is published too late and it probably did not get many attestations, right? So. Lots of attestations in parallel solidify the position of a block in the chain. Block gets published, block gets attested, block gets published, block gets attested, block gets published, block gets attested, right? People understand? Um, raise your hand if you uh, understand. Okay, wow, it's like mo more people understand this than have a refrigerator. This is like amazing. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what happens inside of a blockchain, right? So. Uh, 
I mean, there is, uh, the blockchain keeps track of um, information that we call state, and uh, the, the state that the blockchain keeps track of is made up of accounts, right? And there's two types of accounts. Um, basically, you can think of them for now as like accounts controlled by people and accounts controlled by robots, where the robots also are, are also only exist inside of the chain, right? So, an externally owned account, it, this, this is an account that represents a user, right? So, like for example, if you hold ETH today, that ETH is stored inside of your externally owned account, right? So, there exists a record, which is like an EOA that is in the blockchain, that the blockchain keeps track of, and that object contains a record saying, you know, hey, this address contains this amount of ETH. The other kind of account is what we call a contract. A contract is like a computer program that lives on chain. The, the code of that computer program is on chain. So the chain stores the code of the contract. The chain stores internal storage of the contract. Internal storage is like memory that that contract has the ability to update. And contracts are basically how all applications that that are in Ethereum work, right? So an application is generally has an on-chain component that kind of controls the business logic of that application that generally is one or a set of contracts. So what do contracts look like? Um, so this is an example of a yeah, source code of a simple smart contract. Um, this is, by the way, in a language called uh, Viper. It's uh, a, uh, a less well-known language, it's the yeah, kind of largest alternative to Solidity. Uh, so if people aesthetically prefer coding in Python syntax, I mean, like I personally think Python is like way aesthetically superior to anything using curly braces, but I know this is a, a controversial topic and like half of you are gonna cancel me. Um, but, um, you know, if, uh, if that's you, or if you like some of uh, Viper's uh, kind of other features that like b try to kind of take a very pro uh, or from scratch approach to being sort of more restrictive and more secure in various ways, you can check it out. But this is a yeah, simple you know, contract for a yeah, domain name registry, right? So basically the same sort of thing that ENS is trying to do, right? So what do we have here, right? So we have first like a mapping, right? Domains mapping bytes 32, we're gonna uh, an, uh, to a yeah, domain, right? Um, actually, <laughs> right, uh, so the bytes 32 here is like basically, you know, the address, like what the domain is, right? So the, uh, you know, I'm just kind of being very lazy and very simple, not introducing strings or variable lengths or fancy stuff. And, you know, if you want to like register George, then you would just like put 26 zero bytes and you would like stick George at the end. And, uh, you know, th that would be the key in the mapping. And then the value in the mapping is just who is the owner and what is the IP address that the domain cor uh, corresponds to, right? So then we have two functions. The first function is set owner, right? So the point of this function is basically, if you are the owner, then you can transfer ownership to a new owner. Or if the domain is not yet claimed, then you can call this function, set it to yourself or set it to some owner, and you can become the owner, right? So you should be able to, you know, if you have any programming experience, just kind of read the code and understand what's going on, right? Basically, you look at what the owner of the, the particular domain that you're looking at right now is, and if that owner is zero or if that owner is you, then you can set the owner to whatever you want, right? So that's one function, and then the other function is, well, if you are the owner, you can set the IP. So what's actually going on here, right? Basically, we have these functions, and it's a piece of code. How does this actually uh, kind of translate to what's happening on a chain? Right. So this is a yeah, transaction flow example, right? So basically, uh, what we have here is, um, you know, you have a the uh, contract. It's the uh, a kind of bubble on the bottom, the 0x849c41 um, down there, right? That is... A, uh, an account, it is a contract account, and that contract account is going to have a piece of code. What is that code? It's a compiled version of this, right? So that lives on chain, and then you have um, that contract and that it also has some storage. Now, at the top we have a transaction, right? So as we mentioned before, transactions are like these packaged objects that represent requests to do something. So in this case, um, you will, we're gonna make a request uh, to change the, basically calls a set address, right? So we're gonna call it with a particular domain, we're gonna call it with a particular new address, and you're gonna make a transaction where the two of the transaction, right, the two address, is the uh, account that you're calling, right? So it's gonna be 0x849c41 down there. The data is gonna be the uh, stuff that you call it with. And then the signature is like cryptographic data that proves that it actually is you, the owner of the sender account, 
that actually yeah, created the transaction, right? So the signature determines who the sender is. Only the sender, like only the owner of the actual private key corresponding to the sender can actually create a transaction with that sender. So that transaction gets included in a block. What happens in the EVM, right? So it starts off with a call from the, the account at the top, the uh, CA291D up there, right? The account at the top, which is an externally owned account. That is the account owned by you, right? Now, what does that account do? So what are the state changes that happen? So first of all, your balance goes down a bit to pay for the transaction fee, and then a bit of balance gets transferred to the miner, um, or so, now to the block proposer, and then it makes another call. And that call calls down to the yeah, contract that is the application, and the data of the call encodes what you want to do, and then basically it actually does like a series of storage operations that just are what's happening here, right? So first you do an S load, a storage load, to, base, to figure out like what actually is uh, in the yeah, domain or in the storage for the particular domain. It returns, let's say, a zero because nothing has happened there yet. And then we S store, and um, in this case, uh, you know, we're changing the address, and it's just going to S store at a particular address that, rep that maps to where that domain is stored, and it's going to store the new address there, right? So this is like a very simple example, but like this is a bit of a view of um, you know what happens inside of the EVM when you send a uh, transaction. So gas. This is something in Ethereum that has not changed yet, right? So gas is the uh, unit of resource consumption within Ethereum, right? So examples of gas. Um, so a transaction costs a base twenty-one thousand gas. Each computational step costs usually between two and ten gas, depending on how uh, co how complicated the uh, operation is. Editing a storage slot costs five thousand gas, or it costs twenty thousand gas if the storage slot is not filled yet, and so you're actually expanding the storage. And every byte of data in a transaction costs sixteen gas, or if it's a zero byte, then it only costs four gas. Right? So gas is like this master unit that represents all of the uh, resources that are being consumed during the execution of a transaction. If you send a transaction which gets included in a block, you have to pay a fee that's proportional to how much gas the transaction consumed, right? So whatever amount of res total resources the transaction is consumed, you have to pay an amount proportional to that, right? It, so the fee is basically the, what's called the base fee pr plus priority fee multiplied by the gas you used. So the base fee is like a fee that's adjusted by the protocol, it adjusts up or down to try to keep the usage at, at, at about the same level, and then the priority fee is like an extra amount that you pay to the block proposer to sort of encourage them to add your transaction. And in this particular, generally people just set a priority fee of one, but you know, if there is a particular time where lots and lots of people are sending huge numbers of transactions and the blocks are congested, you can set a higher priority fee to get in first. And a maximum of 30,000 gas can be spent inside of each block. Right? So who remembers how much gas it co um, a yeah, basic transaction costs? Hint, it's in the previous slide. 21,000, okay. Um, so 30, 000, 30 million divided by 21,000. Anyone want to guess about how much that is? One refrigerator, excellent answer, yes. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> okay, right. So it is uh, you know, going to be about in, about in the yeah, 1400 range, right? So a maximum of 1400, you know, roughly simple transactions can make it into each block. And, uh, you know, if the trans, but on average it's going to be 700 because like the priority fee adjusts to keep the average usage around 50, or sorry, the, the base fee adjusts to keep the usage around 15 million. But, um, you know, if the transactions get more complicated, then they start consuming more gas, and, and uh, the, you know you, a block can include fewer of them. So that's what gas is. So this is what a transaction object looks like, right? So a transaction, as we mentioned, is like this big blob of data that represents uh, you know an op a thing that a user wants to do that gets included on chain. Um, and um, you, know, you can see kind of some of the parameters of what they are. So transaction type. Um, this particular transaction type is 0x02, zero, like, zero, there's also 01 zero, and like others before it. Um, chain ID, which chain is this for? Are you even sending a transaction for Ethereum, or for Ethereum Classic, or for ETHPOW? Who here has sent a transaction on ETHPOW? No hands raised, almost. Okay, uh, yeah, a couple of hands raised. Okay, no, no, don't worry, you're not cancelled. Um, so, okay, the, you know, just we want to give people the ability to send a transaction on one chain instead of sending it all, on all the other chains. You know, it's not that hard, right? Um, nonce. This is like an anti-replay value, right? So 
every time you send a transaction that gets included, the nonce also like, has to go up by one each time, right? So this prevents a transaction that you send from being included more than once, pretty simple. Max priority fee and the priority fee that you're paying, max fee, which is like the maximum base fee that you're willing to pay, gas limit, the maximum gas the transaction is allowed to consume, um, destination, which address the transaction goes to, the amount, how much, how much ETH that you're sending. Um, data is, uh, if you're calling a contract, then, the, then what is the data that gets passed in the call? Access to list is like this fancy way to access some accounts and some storage slots kind of earlier and access them a little more cheaply. And then the signature is just like a cryptographic thing that verifies, you know, who sent the transaction. Okay. So high level languages, right? So uh, you know, we mentioned that there is Viper. Um, there's also Solidity, there is also um, you know, LLL, there's like a long list of uh, kind of various high level languages that you can write contracts in. So when you write a, uh, a, a smart contract, you're generally writing in this high level code. There's a compiler. The compiler converts the high level code to bytecode and it also outputs an ABI. Um, ABI stands for application binary interface. It's basically, the way to encode particular like requests, like things that users want to do, like users attempts to call particular functions in the contract into a set of bytes, right? So in this case, like if you call, you know, set owner with a particular, um, you know, with a particular address, actually this should be this should be set IP, I put an IP and that's a bit of a mistake, right? Then you can use the ABI and you can convert that into some call data, right? And the call data is what actually gets into the transaction, right? So there's this kind of logic that happens that basically converts this sort of high level human readable stuff that people want to do. You know, both the human readable code of the contract and kind of human readable instructions like, you know, I want to send Bob 25 ETH because I really like him. You wouldn't put the I really like him part into the contract. You would just like send him a love node off chain or something. Um, but, you know, convert that into a yeah, kind of byte request that the EVM understands. Um, so, proof of stake consensus, right? So. The thing that actually kind of keeps the whole thing safe. So we talked about blocks. We talked about attestations. Who gets to produce these blocks and attestations? Anyone can if they deposit 32 ETH and become a validator, right? And if you have less than 32 ETH, then you can join the system through stake pools, right? So there are stake pools. You know, there's Rocket Pool, there's Lido, there's a, a bunch of other pools. And, you, and if you have less than 32 ETH, you can kind of become part of a validator using a stake pool as well. So. Deposit 32 ETH becomes a validator, and in each slot, 12 seconds, one over 32 of all validators attest to the block that was created during that slot. The uh, validators get revenue, right? So why would you stake? Well, you get rewards. You get two kinds of rewards. You get in-protocol rewards, so you get automatic rewards for creating blocks, creating attestations, you know, doing all, all of the good things, um, and uh, you also get priority fees and MEV from uh, transactions, right? So, you know, you get revenue in two ways. And validators can, you know, withdraw at, at any time. Well, this will be enabled in the next hard fork, right? But validators will be able to withdraw at any time with a delay. Um, and usually that delay will be pretty short, but in extreme cases, like if everyone's trying to withdraw at the same time, then there is going to be a queue and you might have to wait for some amount of time. So. That's proof of stake consensus, right? Basically, yeah, you know, if you have 32 ETH, you can deposit, become a validator, and all of these validators are the ones that participate in this big system of blocks and attestations that keeps the chain progressing and keeps the yeah, blocks that are being added safe. Um, fork choice, right? So the reason why we need to have like weird fancy stuff and consensus is because what if you have this situation where people publish two blocks and those blocks disagree with each other, right? So in this case, you have two blocks and these blocks are, um, you know, they're sister blocks, right? They have the same parent. Um, so clearly you can't get, like, put both of these blocks in at the same time. They might have conflicting transactions. They have some of the same transactions. They even might have some of the same transactions in different order, right? But blocks are, you know, what happens if you have like two blocks that create two conflicting histories? You have to choose one of, you have to choose one of these uh, histories somehow, right? And the mechanism that does this choosing is called the fork choice, right? Because the blockchain forked and we have to choose one, one part of the fork. Mm -hmm. So the mechanism that does this right now, it's called LMD ghost and it's very simple. It's uh, just attestation counting. Basically, 
you have block A and you have block B, and you just count the number of attestations that support block A, or support its children, and then you also count the number of attestations that support block E, block B, or support it indirectly by supporting its children, you see which side has more. In this case, the top side has four, the bottom side has six, the bottom side wins, and so you choose block B, right? So this is one part of the yeah, proof of state consensus. There is also this mechanism called Casper FFG finalization, right? Casper FFG finalization is like this extra gadget that lives on top of this attestation game, and it gives us this really extra special property that if more than two thirds of validators are online and honest, then after two epochs, so one epoch is 32 slots, um, and, or 6.4 minutes, so after 12.8 minutes, a block gets finalized, and that block cannot be reverted, right? So if we take this example, if we take the yeah, block B over here, after one epoch, if more than two thirds of the attesters in that epoch support B, then B is justified, and if after another epoch, more than two thirds of attesters still support B, then B gets finalized, right? Once a block is finalized, it cannot be reverted. But you know, in practice, waiting for the Casper FFG finality is like more a thing for high value use cases. If you are just making a very simple application that's not doing anything super high value, then generally one of what we call safe slot is enough for most applications, right? So if you have one slot where during that slot the proposer acts correctly and you get lots of attestations, then that's like generally enough to be secure. Merkle tree is. Um, who here knows uh, who's um, on the yeah, picture here? Um, who here thinks it's Ray Kurzweil? Who here thinks it's Ray Dalio? Um, who here thinks it's Craig Wright? Who here thinks it's uh, Satoshi? Um, interesting, so a few people think Ralph Merkel is Satoshi. That's fascinating. Okay, I gave away the answer. It's Ralph Merkel, right? So. Ralph Merkel is great because he invented Merkle trees and he also invented um, the uh, Merkle dam guard construction for hash functions, um, which uh, you know actually has uh, has some problems and sponge and uh, it's um, you know why people want to switch to sponges lately. But it was um, you know an amazing invention for its time, and uh, you know he uh, recently do also doing some interesting stuff about cryonics. But you know Merkle trees are great and uh, Doges are also great. Um, Ralph Merkel and Doges are not actually connected. The only connection is that I like both of them, um, but. But the, um, so what are Merkle trees, right? A Merkle tree is like this data structure that lets you create one small object that commits to a large number of objects where it becomes very easy to prove for any one of those objects that that object is inside of this entire big entire tree, right? So you have this one object that's called you know, a header, and it might be committing to like a million different things. And for any one of those million things, you can make a short proof that shows that that one thing actually is you know, in the set of things that, that, that's been committed to. Why do we care about this? Well, Ethereum blocks are big. The Ethereum state is even bigger, right? The Ethereum state is like 40 gigabytes. So what if you want to prove something that happens in a block or prove something about your account, and you want to prove it to someone that has these block headers that are at the top, but that does not have the entire 40, gig 40 gigabytes or the entire you know, really huge amount of, da of, uh, of data in the Ethereum chain? Well, Merkle proofs come to the rescue, right? Basically, you just provide the value, you provide a couple of like sister hashes going up along the tree, and anyone can verify the proof by just kind of continuing to hash up the, uh, the values going, going up together, and then seeing whether the root they get matches, right? So really powerful technology. Ethereum actually you know, uses it everywhere. Um, last fun thing, layer two protocols, right? So most people, uh, or increasingly more and more people don't use Ethereum directly. They use the, what are called layer two protocols that inherit security from Ethereum and add higher scalability on top, right? So rollups, I wrote an article on them. They're really fun. There's a bunch of them. From a user's point of view, living on a modern layer two feels like living on Ethereum. You know, applications work the same way, but because these applications don't stick everything on Ethereum directly, fees are many times lower. So layer twos are great. Layer twos are how Ethereum is, uh, is scaling. And you know, we encourage everyone to pay attention and learn a lot about layer twos this year. So finally, you know, future directions. The merge, done, yay. Um, <laughs> okay, next stop, the search. Increasing scalability, going finally going sustainably below five cents a transaction, go, getting us to thousands of transactions a second. Next up.
The Verge, replacing Merkle trees with more efficient structures that let Ethereum nodes be much lighter. Ethereum nodes don't have to have huge amounts of data. It becomes much easier for anyone to run them. Yay! <laughs> the Purge, clearing out old data, clearing out technical debt, making Ethereum nodes easier to run, making the Ethereum protocol simpler. Woohoo! And uh, the Splurge, grab bag of various useful stuff. Account abstraction. <laughs> EVM improvements. Proposer builder separation. Making everything amazing with ZK Snarks. Yay, Ethereum's getting better and I'll have to keep rewriting this presentation for next year. Amazing. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.